people. Let's see if they can hear me. Does it sound good? Welcome to Cybos. I'm Federico Baruti. Uh, this is, uh, we have the pleasure of being your opening act today uh, as the conference to talk about beyond the buzzwords, understanding the reality of AI's reach. And we have a fantastic panel here uh, to discuss this in depth. And this will be a topic, I think, across the conference quite a bit to, to talk about this. And so I think there will be actually sessions that move, you know, move along the continuum of, of AI and AI platforms and these types of components to really get into the depths of this. Uh, just very briefly on me, I'm uh, Federico Baruti. I'm a partner at McKinsey. I founded and lead McKinsey's automation practice uh, globally in our services AI work. Uh, so a lot of process redesign and implementations in AI and automation. Uh, with financial institutions. So it's a pleasure to be here to help moderate the, the session today. And it's my pleasure to introduce this fantastic panel. So I'm going to kind of step through some quick introductions here so everyone's aware and you've got it on the screen. Um, so Alex Laplante is here beside me. Welcome. Um, Alex is the Vice President of Transformation and the Chief Operating Officer of Technology and Operations of Borealis RBC. Uh, Alex is responsible for operationalizing RBC's technology strategy and driving transformational change within the function. And previously, Alex led Borealis AI's uh, R&D lab for artificial intelligence, where she and her team built and deployed leading-edge AI solutions to com solve complex business problems across the enterprise. And before joining Borealis, Alex held a number of leadership roles at the intersection of enterprise technology, innovation, and finance. She has a PhD in operations research from U of T, and she's a thought leader in finance and technology, and very passionate about women in STEM careers as well, which is very exciting. Beside Alex here is Daniel uh, Schmuckler. He's the Director and Head of Innovation, Member Relations and Strategic Engagements of the Euro Banking Association, or EBA. And uh, Daniel leads EBA's business development, thought leadership, innovation, events, and educational activities, and including running in the association's working groups, the EBA Day Conference, which is a large conference that I'm sure many of you are, are aware of, and professional training seminars in schools. He previously served as the head of communications and corporate governance of EBA Clearing and was a payment system advisor at the European Banking Federation. And so Daniel began his, his career with SWIFT in Brussels and holds graduate degrees in business administration from Boston University and the University of Brussels. So welcome again. Beside uh, is Jacqueline O'Flanagan. She's the financial services industry lead uh, for Microsoft Canada. And Jacqueline uh, leads a diverse Microsoft team empowering financial service institutions in Canada with trusted tools and technology platforms. And prior to joining Microsoft, Jacqueline held leadership positions at CGI, at the London Stock Exchange Group, uh, and with over 20 years of experience in global sales, management, and in information technology, she's passionate about leadership and also mentoring women in the financial services industry. So welcome. Then we've got John Overton beside, who's the CEO of Cove IO. Uh, John is a prolific inventor with over 60 patents worldwide. In the late 80s, Dr. Overton wrote software that went uh, on to be used by two thirds of the world's workstation market. And he co-invented technology utilizing hash tables for locality management. And he led the development in the 2000s of Cove SDM, which is the first truly capable software-defined memory offering. Uh, so Dr. Overton holds postgraduate and doctoral degrees from Harvard and the University of Chicago and has many peer-reviewed publications that uh, all of us have, have dabbled in, at least I have, uh, ahead of uh, today, which is very exciting to have you here. And we have Nadia at the end. Nadia Hijazi is the global head of wholesale digital channels at HSBC. Um, Nadia leads HSBC's digital strategy for the wholesale business and manages digital channels across 53 countries uh, in over 2 billion in transactions. And this includes global platforms like HSBC Net and the mobile-first business banking proposition, HSBC Kinetic. And Nadia is a strong advocate for diversity and inclusion and represents women in technology both within the organization and through industry initiatives and events. So welcome. You see that we have an amazing panel with, I think, diverse perspectives on AI and uh, this continuum that's happening with all of the movement with Gen AI happening. And so I think we'll have hopefully quite an interesting and then provocative discussion. 
Uh, so before we get going, uh, if you guys have the app, I would love for you to hit that Slido button and, um, and actually we'll pull up this question, you know, a couple, couple questions to gauge what's top of mind in the audience and it will color you know, a little bit of the flavor for what we're going to be talking about. So the first question is, how likely are you to build uh, capabilities and deploy AI and Gen AI at your respective companies? Oh, it went away here. Speaking of, oh, there it comes again, perfect. And so we can watch it uh, l dynamically populate as, as you guys fill it in. And so, so far, no one has br been brave to say not likely. So it's, uh, I think, you know, we, we see already what the direction that this is going. Because most places, you know, have already started to at least you know, dabble in predictive analytics and AI uh, a number of years ago, but now there's a, a lot of foundational work that's been happening and a lot of momentum in the space. Um, so it's, it's good to see that there's quite a, bit of, uh, quite a bit of responses in that area. There is actually one, you know, it sounds like not likely person because maybe there's the skeptic in the, in the crowd, so we'll be definitely trying to delve into that part of the discussion as well today. Maybe let's go on to the next question. The next question is, oh, here we go. Maybe I have to hit this. What are you most worried about regarding AI and Gen AI? And we can pop up already the dynamic responses as people start to fill it in. There we go. So there's, uh, between risks and governance, already a lot of responses in that area. Um, and we'll definitely be talking about that. Some are worried about failed investments or getting stuck in pilot purgatory that never really goes all the way. You know, some, some have, yeah, a few have indicated the challenges between technology and business sides of the organization, which, which sometimes comes up, and also reputational risks if if some of these aspects fail, but clearly there's a overwhelming majority here for the panel to be thinking about is that there's a, a lot of thought around risk and governance uh, that people are, are concerned about, so we'll make sure we spend some time on that today. So just as we, uh, we'll pause this display now, and then we'll go, yeah, so just as we get going, I was asked to just say a few words for quick minutes before we start to delve into questions and discussion with the panel, just to set the table a little bit for, for the discussion today. And so, you know, everyone has been seeing and maybe playing with uh, generative AI as part of their pastime and maybe starting to think about it with respect to the companies. And so what is generative AI? And there's a continuum, if you think about it, between, you know, traditional uh, advanced analytics, you know, doing work, you know, that all of us probably have done in trying to do regressions and do some forms of predictive analytics. And then that has entered, you know, more predictive AI. And a lot of institutions have been working, you know, around thinking about predictive AI and trying to use drivers and data to, to predict outcomes so that you could focus human time and human work on judgment around that and enable kind of uh, prediction from AI. Generative AI is sort of the next extension of this continuum. And there will be discussions across this whole continuum at this, uh, at this conference. But it enables the creation of new unstructured content, text, and images. Uh, we've probably seen even some of these songs that have been written, you know, with the lyrics with generative AI and some of the music uh, mimicking, you know, different people's voices with generative AI. And it's powered by foundational models. And these are artificial intelligence models that are, use a broad set of data to come up with you know, some of these adapted and wide range of tasks. Now, of course, the importance of data is clear because the contextual part of data to make those AI predictions work is quite important, and we'll be talking about that. Uh, you know, it goes without saying that the momentum for generative AI uh, it has been accelerating quite a bit. Since 2017, you can see this page just is an illustration of logos, but there's been a proliferation of activity. And in this year, you know, since March, essentially, and even since fall last year, there have been a lot of movements from chat GPT to GPT-4 into this year and many others that have started up. 
And so the, the long and the short of it is that nobody is ahead of anybody else by more than two to six months on these types of things, says Jan LeCun, who's the chief AI scientist at Meta. And so, you know, suffice it to say that the space is moving very quickly, but it's also very new and there's also a lot of risks. And so I think our panel will be, you know, discussing a lot of those things. With respect to impact, I'm going to just paint a quick picture of what it could do, but I'm not going to assert whether it will do it or whether it will work. Our panel will opine on, uh, on some of these things. But there are three main types of impact you know, that we could imagine Gen AI leading to. And, you know, obviously as a part of that, just like with any AI and automation, it does require re-engineering and rethinking of the way work happens and some elements to actually enable the technology to work. So that connects with acceleration, you know, and extracting and indexing of data in different ways. There's automation, you know, given that there's a lot of human labor that could be adjusted or augmented or enabled, uh, you know, through the uses of these types of technology. And that whole concept of augmentation is what connects these two things. Now, the challenge is that, you know, humans interpreting data is fast and free and multidimensional from analog data to all f forms of data. For machines to do it, we need to make sure that those large language models and the data is clean and contextualized and verified in some cases for it to work. And so there's a bunch of steps in the process that need to be in place for that to work effectively. And a lot of places haven't gotten that right, even in predictive uh, analytics and predictive AI, and not to mention with some of these new technologies yet. And so Gen AI could have impacts on our customers and financial institutions. There's elements that people have stipulated around personalized offers, you know, digital uh, document intake that's all digitized and automatic, automatic pre-fill of information, 24-7 optimization routing through virtual agents. Uh, the fact that your advisors would be enabled with more technology to get up the learning curve faster and maybe tap into more sources of data. Um, and there could be AI-powered fraud detection, you know, that enables a safer interaction and experience. So all sorts of things that are important to the customer and to the value chain itself from strategy and resourcing, you know, all the way through distribution and the way that we interact, you know, to the operational planning and execution of, of actually basically getting to fulfillment. There's so many use cases that are starting to get, you know, d proliferated and discussed, but not that much in production yet. So with this, the, with this context, we just wanted to set the table. We've got this panel, and we're going to start to delve into some of these topics, and with in mind a little bit the, the pointer that um, the audience gave us on risk and governance. So as we get going, you know, the first question, uh, maybe I'll start with you, Daniel, uh, since with, through EBA, you see a lot of different institutions all the time and you, through your travels and through your work. And so if we consider this continuum from advanced analytics into prediction into gener generative AI, um, can you help frame where we are today and uh, the opportunity? Wow, that's a very challenging question because in the way uh, I think generative AI is not the end of the journey. It's just another milestone in between, right? But when you look at banks, traditionally, they have been investing quite a lot in AI, but in more traditional forms of AI. So uh, what we would call machine learning, right? Robotics process automation. And for very practical reasons. So typically uh, for data analytics, uh, forensics, you know, when it comes to fraud, fraud patterns, etc., cetera, uh, chat, bots, right? Um, and different areas where there are very practical applications for AI. Um, but to my knowledge, and again, it's not a topic that uh, we have a separate or dedicated working group on, but it kind of flows into the context of uh, transaction banking topics like uh, real-time payments when it comes to fraud uh, fighting or uh, open finance, open banking, right, when it comes to um, understanding uh, the data and how can you uh, create data opportunities. So AI always comes in there. And um, generative AI is not, so to say, top of mind yet in many of the conversations I have at the practical side. So in the operations rooms or in, in, the, in the analytics rooms. So uh, a lot more is still being relied upon uh, with traditional AI means. 
But I think it's not the end of the journey. I think it's, it continues to be a very interesting uh, take up and adoption in, in banks as well. Great. Nadia, what do you think from the banker seat sitting there and seeing it day to day? Uh, how does that, what do you think and how does that feel? Yeah, so I think we see three horizons with um, AI. So as you said, Daniel, a lot of work on the predictive AI, machine learning, but a real focus to make sure that everybody understands how it works because at the moment, the teams that tend to be working on that tend to be quite isolated. So there's a lot of work going on in the bank to really get people familiar with What do we mean by predictive AI? Why do we feel it's more reliable? Why are we comfortable to use it for fraud and AML um, and some very high risk items? But also to understand how do you do the control framework around it and how people can go through the model governance process and what kind of skills you then need in the assurance teams to really understand the model governance and to be able to get the right data to feed the models so that you're constantly learning and driving And sort of one of the things the foundation we see is getting that knowledge embedded within the organization. So that's kind of what I would call the first horizon, which is kind of optimized for today. The second horizon is build for tomorrow. So since generative AI came out, uh, we've really doubled down on it. And we've basically gone out across the bank and we've set up Teams chats where we're basically sharing information from the generative AI teams across the bank. So people get an understanding of what does it mean? Again, what are the regulators saying about it? Um, and then we've asked for use cases. We've asked for all of the teams to come up with what they think use cases are. Now, we know only a small percentage of these will be valid in the end. But what it does is it builds up a muscle within the organization where people really start to learn about the different models of AI and you're really educating your workforce as well as all of your uh, compliance teams. And then it's really around how do we shape the future. And for us, we're such a large organization in so many countries, one of the key things for us is where is regulation going to go? Because if the UK does something completely different to the US to another place, it's going to get very fragmented. So one of the things that we want to do is kind of work with partners, work with regulators, and work with the teams to really understand what the art of the possible is by doing it responsibly and ethically. Because what we're also keen about is we don't want to just do generative AI because it's like the coolest thing to do. It has to be really solving a problem internally. A lot of the current use cases are internal cases and has to be adding value and doing it in a way that's not opaque. Um, and that's kind of, I would say, one of the greatest challenges around generative AI is removing that opaqueness and mystique. Great point. And I think, so that's, that gives us a little bit of a, a flavor also of this path to success component. And Jacqueline, I'd love for you to, to push us a little bit on this, on what's needed for the foundations to start to make this work. You know, do, do you ever, does everyone jump on the Gen AI bandwagon or are there foundational pieces and platforms and elements that you have to put in place to make it right? That's a great question, and I love Nadia's response as well. Um, and so from a Microsoft perspective, we believe uh, our mission is to empower every person on the planet and organization to achieve more, and we take that very seriously. And so when we think about it through the lens of AI, we actually have a set of governance and framework set up, and we feel that every organization should really lean into that, and one of the biggest parts of that is accountability. Um, but for others in the audience, and I strongly encourage people to look and really understand what's happening through the regulatory lens as well, Last week, we had Brad Smith, our vice chair and president um, from our legal group, speak with the Senate uh, in the U.S., and we're in discussions with the Vatican as well, making sure that we understand what the frameworks are from a civilization perspective, and I think that that's going to be critical for that. I think the other part of it is, as organizations really start to think about what AI means to them and to their organizations, It's important to have that ethical view, as Nadia mentioned, but it's also critical to set up a governance framework within your organization to have that 360-degree view as to what's happening across the organization, what the use cases are, what the short-term view is, as well as that longer-term horizon as well. So Excellent. And Alex, what's your view on that one to, to kind of... 
Yeah, sure. So I, I definitely agree with a lot of the points that have been made. Um, I think it, undoubtedly there's a lot of benefits to be had from artificial intelligence. And I think that's true whether we're talking about traditional AI, and I honestly can't even believe that that's what we're calling it now, or some of these more forefront technologies like uh, generative AI. But I always think it's about that balance of, of risk versus reward, um, especially speaking on behalf of a, a large financial institution. That is definitely top of mind. What I will say, though, is when it comes to to more of the traditional forms of AI, I think a lot of organizations are moving on the right path. There typically are governance frameworks in place, and we're starting to get a really good comfort level with deploying those types of models in the higher risk areas. When it comes to generative AI, I think first we have to take a little bit of a step back and think about what differentiates it. What, is, what makes it different from those more traditional forms that might give us pause? One of the characteristics is generalizability. These models are very, very flexible. You mentioned foundation models. So it's basically this idea that you have a model that now can be applied to different use cases, different domains very easily. When we think about traditional AI, typically we've seen narrow applications. So you have a model that's purpose-built for a particular use case. Taking that model and shoving it somewhere else, it's probably not going to work that well for you. So generalizability, very exciting from a large enterprise perspective, really thinking through scalability in the future. How do we make sure we're choosing the right use cases today and scaling those effectively going forward? The second thing that we're seeing is just the sheer speed that everything is happening. And you alluded to this. And I'll jest a little bit here in saying that uh, state of the art today might be totally obsolete next week. And so it's just how, as an organization, do you actually stay on top of the pace of change to make sure that you're understanding where we are as a technology. And there's one nuance that I want to call out here, which is when we think about traditional ways that algorithms are developed, typically it's researchers sitting in a lab they do a ton of experiments, they write a paper, it takes a couple of years to come to publication, and over those years we're sitting and we're having conversations about risks, limitations, challenges of those algorithms. If something is happening immediately, we're not having those same conversations because we don't have the time. And so I don't want that to be lost. I think it's great to move quickly. I also think we do have to come back to some of those very serious conversations which have, which have already been alluded to. And the, the last point maybe I'll make is around democratization of a very sophisticated capability. You don't have to know how to program in any language to leverage the world's most powerful models. All you have to do is be able to write a natural language and you can build full-fledged products. This is, of course, very exciting for upskilling our workforce. We also have to think about the flip side of that. Right? There have been historically a lot of missteps with the utilization of AI, uh, where it hasn't been deployed responsibly or ethically, and that came out of the world's best teams. And so now we have everyone playing around with models that are much, much more sophisticated. I do think that should give us a little bit of pause in terms of, especially within our own organization, who has access, how we're leveraging those models. Mm -hmm. It was just a few weeks ago that, uh, that Elon Musk was in court for the first uh, you know, self-driving car incidents that occurred. And so it starts to, we start to kind of feel you know, those things happening and it connects that. You mentioned one thing I wanted to prod on a little bit, which is the pace of change is so extreme. How do you stay on top of it? And I'd love kind of the panel's view of this as well as how should organizations, you know, and what are the archetypes of staying connected to the space? RBC and Borealis have done one model, right? And you could maybe talk about that for a second, but I'd love to kind of hear about that for a second. So I, I guess for me, the, the, the danger that we have with AI is, as Alex said, it's out in the wilderness, if you want to call it that way, which means that people who want to abuse it will be able to abuse it, right? You've seen a lot of synthetic voice fakes come up. You know, for me, that's the next threat to the customers, right? A lot of banks have callback. You know, I, I'm, tons of banks have a system which says, if you've got doubt, call back the customer. Now, the minute you get this synthetic voice fake thing, that completely eliminates that control. It's the same control we tell our customers for business email compromise. It's like, don't change the address, 
without phoning your customer and checking, but suddenly you've got the whole control eliminated and there's a real need kind of within the financial institutions to really kind of focus on that. We're kind of thinking about the cool stuff about generative AI, but we also need to think about how we're going to use it to protect our customers um, and the other controls we have within the banks for, for, for a good reason. Yeah. Maybe, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. These are really good points, Alex, that you made because um, you said, uh, first of all, you need something that's rule-based, right? And those are typically associated to traditional AI. So it's rule-based. Uh, you have that in, in robotics process automation. When you go to an operations environment, you don't want it to be too creative. You wa actually want it to be very much within narrow parameters, right? And as a, as a banking organization, the biggest asset you bring to the forefront vis-a-vis -vis your customer base is trust. What you don't want is an AI going rogue on you. So very much that sort of control over and that span of control over the outcome is extremely important. So I think uh, to Alex's point that you need to pause a bit, you know, by really making sure that whatever application you start running on AI can evolve in a fashion that keeps you in control, right? I, I think that's very important. It's not about generative AI, uh, as, as, you, as you pointed out, it's out there, right? It's not about just trying to pilot it in all different environments without understanding what your control will be on the outcomes. And I think as a bank, traditionally, we need to stay a little bit conservative about that. And I think the, the, the opportunities uh, that still come from traditional forms of AI are not fully yet exploited within banks. There's much more we could do in different uh, areas. And I mentioned some of it, right? Forensics, uh, fraud pattern analysis, right? Now, to the points that you mentioned, you're absolutely right. The moment criminals start using AI to actually uh, defeat our own systems, right? This is where you need to step up the game, clearly. This, this, this would change. Uh, yeah. yeah. There's so let's opportunities for us, but also everyone else, yeah. Yeah, so let's switch gears a little for a second. Um, you know, John, you've proposed uh, that AI could be limited in its utility in, in some, some different discussions. And this isn't a very common view. There's at least a couple people in the audience that maybe were in that view from, the, from this. But could you tell us more and elaborate on, on that? Sure, I think uh, we're in the next evolution of computing, and that's where AI is. Um, I don't think that this is something that has never happened before or won't happen again. It's another moment, um, n number one. Uh, number two, uh, it's profoundly useful, right? There's no question that it's not profoundly useful. But we are at the tiniest of its beginning. And people are talking about, oh, it's going to change everything. And I, we may talk about use cases, which I'll bring some width to a little bit later. But um, we're at the stage where we need to be thinking about the core fundamental components of its contribution, not the frilly, the buzzy words, and, but what are the materially useful things. And so, for example, there's a research that, uh, that Cybos, you know, that the Swift folks are doing. Um, building a data, a, a generic synthetic data generator that models. It's four, in the research, it's four decimal points, you know, accurate to the real data right now. Like, this is unfathomable five years ago. Now, I don't know when that'll come out. I don't know, you know, that's a whole another you know, can of worms here, but, um, but that's doable. So we talk about the concerns with generative AI or whatnot. What if you could model everything that goes on in financial services statistically meaningfully. That's core contribution. Now that's real AI, and that's just at the very beginning. So my view on the limits of AI isn't that it can't go places, but that the only way it scales is massive models. And if you want massive models, you have a huge problem with storage. Storage, a four-hour job that hits storage takes 20 days, and you're going to train a model a thousand times, a thousand twenty days. It can't work. It has to be driven by memory efficiencies. Again, again, that's core. So my kind of pushback on this is we are sometimes wrapped around um, some of the cuteness of what it is, 
but for where it goes in society, we better be betting on the stuff that's going to change the world for a positive effect. And there are things and initiatives that are going along. So it's a little bit more nuanced than limited, but yes. Yeah, good. Well, I'm glad that you could uh, clarify that. Panel, what do you think on responses on John's view? I mean, I agree. I think there's a, I think it's personally, I know there's dangers with it, but I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, and it just depends on, you know, how clever you are in using the generative AI to, to do what you want. So, you know, an example that we have is, you know, you have to generate tons of test data sometimes to do proper performance testing of banking systems to prove the resilience, right? This is something that we all have to do as part of our operational resilience risk. Generative AI is very good at generating a ton of data that you can use in those kind of performance tests. That's a very simple case, and it's a case that doesn't impact a customer, but allows you to show you the limits of where you can take your system and where you've got some challenges um, around it. I think even calls coming into help desks, right? We're all drowning in thousands and thousands of phone calls. That's another good example of a lot of data. It's contained data to John's point. It's not like, you know, you don't have to worry that it's coming from somebody who's put something on Wikipedia. It's your own data. Mm -hmm. But you can use the model to really try to understand the sentiment of the caller and what the generative AI is telling you, the problem that's going on that you don't really get from other help desk type of technology. So I do, I do agree with John. It's, it's really about how you use the use cases, how you contain the response, how you identify if there's like malicious feedback tailoring going on, and, and really just playing around with those use cases to solve some of the problems, I think, that are common across most of the financial institutions. Yeah, I would say I, I generally agree as well. Uh, and I think that's what makes it so exciting, the fact that we're just scratching yeah. the surface. Like, I think the reality is we don't really know where this ceiling of capability is. And I also agree that we're probably going to be constrained by things like compute and storage before we're constrained by the algorithm's um, abilities themselves. I would also maybe add in the view, though, that I don't necessarily think we need the world's most sophisticated models for every single problem. And it's it's great to be excited about generative AI, but I also think, again, we have to take a little bit of a step back and think about where in our business is that actually going to make a difference. In the end of the day, we do have to remember that it's always about cost benefit. AI is expensive, the talent's expensive, the data's expensive, the compute's expensive. Supporting, uh, maintaining, monitoring models in production for perpetuity is expensive. And so you really do want to make sure that you're using these models, whether it's generative AI or other words, uh, in areas that you're going to get the benefit for it, right? And there's probably a lot of cases where a more straightforward natural language processing technique or rules-based approach might actually get you most of the way there. And so um, really should be considering, I think, where we're using these very large-scale models. I mean, it's massively compute-intensive. Yeah. Yeah. And if, Sorry, I was just going to say, if I can just add to that, I mean, I agree with your point that this is kind of this moment in time. But when we look back, AI is not something that's today. It's been in existence for the last couple of years, and it's going to continue to build momentum. And so when we talk about the use cases, I think we're really just at the infancy of what we're seeing across all organizations and industries across the world. From a financial services perspective, we've talked about some of the large compute opportunities, but even being able to service clients in underutilized uh, ways has been a real driver for what we're starting to see. So whether that's in loan origination, creating operational efficiencies, even thinking about portfolio management, being able to optimize some of that research exactly. uh, capability. Exactly. And so these aren't areas where we need significant amount of large language models, but they are able to move the needle from both an operational efficiency, uh, client sentiment, and all of these other areas as well. And so I think one of the other big parts, and I know Nadia had mentioned it, but is the sentiment. Uh, organizations are really starting to dive into that now in areas they did not have opportunity or access previously. So being able to listen in on a call with a client, understand the overall sentiment, positive, negative, how does this impact training to the organization to allow them to attract new clients and different things like that. So I think we're really just at the precipice of what this can do. Exactly. And a lot of organizations exactly. are really just starting to dive in and say, yep. what is the art of the possible? How can we transform our organization? Yep. And how can we really transform an industry collaboratively? So, mm -hmm. 
and talking about organizations, uh, and you referred to it, Alex, with regard to resourcing, I mean, the people that will uh, need to be in-house to really continue developing on this technology are not your correspondent bankers that you have right. nowadays. Right. I mean, these are going to be uh, data scientists, AI engineers, you need API managers, yeah. right? This is a very different breed of what we used to call just a banker, right? And, and these people are in high demand. And just as a nod to Microsoft, I think um, AI, as a, from a technology perspective, doesn't stand in isolation. I believe that most AI applications that will be used in the future will be cloud-enabled. Mm -hmm. If banks don't move you know, towards the cloud with, mm -hmm. with, with a large part of their uh, uh, functionalities, I think they will be inhibited mm -hmm. by not being able to roll out in, in a timely fashion and with the with with the sufficient uh, processing capabilities yep. to make use of these AI yep. capabilities. Yeah, but th this is the the point of my earlier comment. This is the conversation, yeah. right? It's not about the hype and the thrill of it. It's about what can it actually do, and there are classes of tasks that don't need large language models. There are classes that do. And you have to start evolving, and I think it's a societal issue. You have to start evolving people toward objectives and outcomes, and then you use the tools that are applicable, yeah. and those are going to vary. So let's let's dig into the use cases. I think we're all craving a bit of this use case um, specificity. I'm even seeing questions trickling in on this topic. But maybe we'll start with Jacqueline. We're going to go across, but we're going to go d deeper on this. We've talked a little bit around data and ingestion of data and storage already. But you know, what's your sense of how we should tackle this in the use cases that make sense? What are your favorites? Oh, man. Um, <laughs> so uh, f being at Microsoft, we have an interesting perspective because we get to work across industry and see a multitude of use cases. And so I think as we're starting to see this, you know, people are starting with some of the less sophisticated uh, opportunities. We're seeing a lot of people wanting to kind of dive into AI with chatbots and things like that. Um, but we're starting to see a big evolution. And so we try and encourage people to start small. You're not going to try and boil the ocean and transform <coughs> your whole organization all at once, um, but really starting to dive in. And so prioritizing you know, what those use cases are, what drives the most value, what is probably some of the safest opportunities. Uh, and when we think across financial services, and I know that I've mentioned some of them on this call uh, or on this chat, but when we think about loan origination being one of the core areas, when you think about M&A from a research perspective, being able to culminate some of the pitch books that historically would have taken you know, 200 plus man hours to be able to distill that down, you still need to validate it with a human. And so at every stage of the game, there is that co-reasoning component to this. Um, but those would be probably some of the bigger ones. I mean, I think everyone's really looking to say, what is the overall experience that we're trying to drive? And so we're seeing a lot of demand for contact center um, and other areas like that, and really being able to cut down the significant amount of human hours into something a little more tangible. Nadia, what about you? What are you seeing as uh, ones that have already been successful or up and coming favorite use cases? I mean, most of our successful use cases at the moment would fall into the category of predictive AI. And that's across everything. That's like omni-channel, you know, sales prompts, insights, um, CDD, um, AML, fraud. Those are all really good use cases for predictive AI. I think with the generative AI, as I said, we've got many, many use cases we're exploring at the moment, all the way from an internal chatbot that can kind of demystify all the policies that all of our RMs have to like go through. And that's one that we're really excited about because I don't know about everybody else, but we just issue too much material to our front lines mm. and we expect them to be able to remember everything. So. Um, the, the nice thing about the generative AI is it kind of summarizes it. I always think about generative AIs. I think the reason people are so excited is I think we're all bored with getting links on a page and trawling through them. The, the nice thing about it is that summary capability and breaking it up into chunks. And where we really see that opportunity is, is for those frontline teams where we're giving stuff. Now, we see that you have to have generative AI with a human, right? This concept that it's going to be just depend on what it says. No, we're saying generative AI with human judgment is really where we need to be headed with the use cases and how we take them forward. Yeah, that, that's an interesting point because this enablement piece as an augmentation piece and training, 
you know, flattening the learning curves has been mm -hmm. talked about quite a bit. Alex, on a foundational point, um, there's a lot of discussions around, can we apply AI and generative AI to things that people already do to do it better or more efficiently or, you know, whatever, or should we do things that people can't do at all uh, for use cases, that it's something out there that people don't, wouldn't touch? What's your view on that? Yeah, so I think that's the beauty of AI is you can have it all. Right, you can. I, I think you can have applications of artificial intent, intelligence uh, across that entire spectrum. So starting with human augmentation, and and there's a couple of use cases that have already been mentioned. A really big one, I would say, in the development community is obviously code generation, code assist, um, and the beauty of that use case, in my mind, actually speaks to what Nadia said around this idea of human in the loop making sure that you have an ac expert practitioner as your first step mm -hmm. in deploying generative AI, wow. uh, where you have someone who is able to actually verify the output of content. And there's some really interesting studies that are just starting to come out, actually, that are speaking to uh, organizations that have provided uh, generative AI to their workforce and seeing the productivity gains there. And what's interesting, at least to me, about this is it's not only in terms of the speed of completion of tasks, but also in the quality of completion of those tasks. And so my guess is that we're going to see continued application of human augmentation across the board, whether that be in call centers, whether that be in back office, et cetera. Um, then I think when it comes over to some of the more traditional applications, augmentation, automation, that's not going away. I think uh, we've just really scratched the surface in terms of those capabilities as well. So anything from risk management, algorithmic trading, all the way to things like what you mentioned at the opening around hyper-personalization. The, the reality is that human, I might be able to have 30, 50 really deep relationships where I could service my clients very, very well. But beyond that, right, we start to hit the limits of human capability. Uh, a lot of that can be very much supported through artificial intelligence. And then I think the, the last bucket is the, the what's next. And um, it's really interesting. And I actually think generative AI offers a lot of uh, opportunities here, really forcing us to think about our current business models, our current revenue streams, um, but also when we think about external factors, there's a lot of individuals who are building, as I alluded to before, full-fledged products within a weekend. And so I think that's probably going to drive some amount of disintermediation uh, for some of our functions going forward, which is something that we're going to have to, I think, keep an eye on. John, do you agree? Is that what we should focus on? Um, I, I agree a great deal with what you say uh, all the way around. Um, so use cases, right? Is that what? Okay. So I'd like to open it up a little bit yep. even more. Um, you know, as I said earlier, I think we're at the very, very beginning. And even at the very beginning, if you just let it happen, you can see things that are going on in the world that you would never have imagined. So just projects that we're involved with. Um, you know, what if you could use satellite images? to uh, use AI to analyze water patterns. You can increase crop yield 20%, we're doing this in Tanzania, where you can increase the entire country's crop yield 20% by taking pictures from the sky and taking algorithms. Mm -hmm. How much does that cost? And how valuable is that? Okay, uh, swing another one. Um, graph databases, everybody's familiar with you know, who's doing the high end of the, of the financial community. Uh, you know, you could take our software and you could create 100 terabyte graph databases. Okay, what's the largest server that you can get in Azure? You know, 32, uh, 32 terabytes, right? Triple it, quadruple it, no problem. What can you do with graph databases? I mean, the, the, the limit is just unbelievable. You use graph databases uh, and graphs are one of the critical components of AI. The biggest limiting factor is you can't get enough coverage for the large analytic models. Um, anomaly detection in financial services. So as I mentioned before, you know the SWIFT folks are working on some research um, with that. You could imagine a scenario at some point where every transaction that goes through the SWIFT network, every single transaction is analyzed against all legally capable other transactions in real time at line speed. You want to talk about security, you know, securitization of financial services? These are substantive contributions. Now, those use cases are only the very, very beginning. 
where I think it goes and where I'm really in agreement with you and, and, also, and also you is where we really want to be thinking, I think at some point, is how do you use AI to think about problems that humans wouldn't have thought about? I mean, that's the place to go. It's just talking about the exciting wild, wild west. You know, uh, robotic arms, for example. We, you know, I think you, know, you and I have mentioned this. You know, we built designed infrastructures around the metal that you have in robotic arms. Well, you can use AI in 3D metal. We work with somebody who has one of the two 3D metal printers in the world. They use AI to model the way and design the way robots should have arms. They can print them out in a machine. You know, the time that used to take to do that, one to two years. They can do that in four days, right? That changes industrialization. Like, this is incredibly exciting, and it's just the beginning. Opening this up a bit to the panel on other, you know, the crux of the problem. We've talked a little bit around the use cases. Are there, is it technology? Are there process limitations, change management? What, what kind of, what else is there here around these use cases? And I think we've we've touched on a couple of probably the technical challenges just in terms of capacity that I think we're going to hit in the future. But maybe another lens to, to look at this by, and in my experience, oftentimes in large organizations, technology programs don't fail because of the technology. Uh, they fail because of the, the soft pieces that are involved. So the people, yeah. the culture, the processes. Um, and maybe one specific example that I'll call out here. We've already talked a little bit on the panel about education uh, and upskilling of our business in terms of their understanding of technology. And I'm a massive proponent of education education, so we'll always encourage continuation of learning. But we never really talk about upskilling our technologists with an understanding of our business. And I think in order to be successful in large enterprises, education has to be bi-directional. It has to be technologists upscaling our business and our business upscaling our technologists. And once you have that bridge across the board and you have that common understanding, that common language, it is much, much easier to drive large-scale technology programs to success at the end of the day because you're speaking in the same words, you have the same base understanding, and you can tell whether things are starting to go off the rails or not. Uh, and I think often that is a small thing that it, that is missed. Mm. And if I can just add to what Alex had just said, I think it's something that we're seeing across the board as well. And it's not just edu educating your staff and your team and your technologists, it's educating your board as well. Yeah. And so when you think about a lot of these complex decisions that are going to be impacting all of our organizations for years to come, it's really important to have that guidance and framework at the board level. And so a lot of what we're doing now is educating on ethical AI and the impact to industry and the impact to business, because it's something that's going to have a significant effect across the entire globe. And so when you have that alignment from top to bottom, I think it definitely helps with the decision-making process and mm. culture across the organization. Yeah. On the point of education, uh, I recently read an article that in the, in the UK and in the US, you have nine times as many gr undergraduate and graduate courses at university level on AI than in continental Europe. Wow. I mean, that kind of makes you think, are we preparing the next generation of leaders really to be capable of understanding the potential of this technology. It starts at that level for me. Before it comes into the banks because uh, and, and other financial institutions and other industries, because we cannot leave the private sector by itself to just create its own neat workforce. Uh, and and I, I think there is a public-private sector uh, collaboration that's required. And on the point of collaboration, I also noticed that uh, there is a geopolitical battle between the US, China, Europe f to get competitive advantage on, on AI. And the problem is, and I think that testifies a bit also to the theme of this Cybos conference, uh, we talk about collaborative finance in a fragmented world, but that's exactly what we will face on AI. Mm -hmm. There will be island solutions, right? Uh, highly competitive, you know, where, where, where governments will promote uh, their industry to be, uh, you know, AI can, uh, enabled, and they will ha compete with others, right? And we need to also start thinking as an in here, as a, as, a, as a financial industry, where's the collaborative element in all of this? 
it has to be competitive, but there needs to be also, I think, a collaborative baseline where we can do things together mm -hmm. rather than just looking at, you know, outspending our competitors on AI. If I can just add to that mm -hmm. for one second. And so when you think about this collaboration across industry, um, and I mentioned a little bit about the Vatican and some of the discussions we're having with the Senate, but Microsoft is one of many companies who have joined in a collaborative effort to support industry regulation on AI, and it's called Frontier. Uh, and it's an organization with the largest hyperscalers around the world and the regulators so that we can create this, you know, 360 degree view across industry and across geography because I agree with you currently today we are somewhat fragmented but I think with efforts like this to bring this together it will help with that broader collaboration across industry yeah and there was a question from yeah. <coughs> the audience on this around you know are you feeling that that's getting cohesion because you know especially yeah. given the, the theme of the conference that are we getting momentum on a fr on the fragmentation here I would say we are, it's, and this is still relatively new, it's just been announced within the last couple of months, but we are starting to see more and more demand for collaborative conversations. I think early on, everyone was thinking they wanted first mover advantage, they wanted to understand and kind of depict their own you know, image of what AI meant for them and their organization, and now they're starting to step outside their own walls and say, what is the broader impact on humanity and civilization and the ethical aspect of what this means for our generation? And now we're starting to see this really start to come together. So I think this is just one of, you know, the next steps as we evolve on this journey. Uh, yeah, I've been hammering away on the technology of it, but I would propose, I think this is even bigger than yeah. the technology because we can create things at a rate and it's only going to get more and more uh, at a rate that we can't understand what we're really creating. I mean, that's the real risk. And the, the human infrastructure for that is going to be critical on that. Yeah, let's let's go into that further. Uh, you know, there was we saw from the poll that uh, you know the audience was worried about the risks and reputational components and limitations of that. Maybe Nadia, give us your thoughts from the risk side from the from the banking standpoint. Yeah, I mean, I think the banks are grappling with how do you put the right control framework around this, particularly because a lot of the sort of open AI aren't going to share your, their model with you and they're not going to share the data that they've used to train that model because in a sense that's their IP. So when you're working with all of these, how do you put that control framework around it? The regulators are all now moving very, very quickly because they've got a lot of pressure from their own governments and their own countries. And AI fundamentally is all about data governance, and we know that the way each country legislates on data governance is fundamentally different, right? In Europe, you have GDPR. In other places, you have different regulations. In China, India, Vietnam, you have data localization where the data is not allowed out the country, uh, and they're very specific about that. So I think you've got this really complex environment within the banks about doing it. And then in terms of the skill set within the banks, we don't have the right people that would understand that a lot of our regulatory compliance people are lawyers, they're ex-lawyers, right? They're not necessarily trained on algorithms and models and how data works with it. So I think you've got within this kind of really complicated mix now, there's got to find a way forward so that we don't kind of like suffocate innovation with too much risk management. But I think in the first days, I think a lot of this regulation and movement is going to put a stop to some of the use cases going forward. I would liken it to the early days of cloud, if anybody can remember that. But at that point, everyone was panicking. Oh my God, I'm going to put my system in a third party. How am I going to protect it? And it took a while. And even in some countries, they're only just now moving on to it. So I think we'll see the same kind of life cycle um, in that, particularly in the regulated industries where people, I don't think customers want us to be experimenting with things like that, if I'm honest. They're like, you're a bank, you're safe, I want to <laughs> put my money with you and please don't, you know, play around with anything risky, right? And it's about how do we create that trust and, and confidence level, but also how do we get comfortable, right? We can't have data that's got bias in it or ethical challenges, and we can't run a model that if we get challenged by a regulator, it's too opaque for us to be able to demonstrate why we reached a conclusion off the back of that model. 
Yeah, John, you had also mentioned an angle on this on energy efficiency, given the data storage and importance. What's what's the? Uh, yeah, well, it's a whole other uh, <laughs> dimension, yeah. um, and I, I, I'm trying very hard not to do infomercials um, about my company. Uh, but if you can control the memory, you can reduce the server energy from 12 to 14 to 54 uh, percent. Supermicro and Red Hat did a test with us with 2.165 quadrillion tests. Uh, and under any workload, just installing software can change the energy footprint. Now, just imagine this writ large. If I could reduce the power signature of a data center by 50 percent, um, I'll give you a little illustration on this. Uh, in the SEC filing for Verizon, they spent $1.1 billion last year um, on power. Okay, installing software, they save $500 million. Okay, but it's not only that. Think about the environmental benefit of this. I mean, this is doable right now. I mean, buy super micro servers and they work. I mean, so the, the environmental impact that AI ha can bring to bear is just profound. Hmm. And one question from the audience uh, was around, you know, technologies then coming together and building off of each other. Is there a view here on then quantum computing or AI intersecting with the blockchain or, you know, a, you know all these types of kind of intersections? What are any thoughts from the, the group on this? I mean, even when we talk about AI systems, it's usually not just a single AI model. It's the AI model is part of a much broader system. Yeah. My expectation is that we'll continue to see some of these overlaps as we go forward. And there's already a lot of research being done actually on uh, machine learning algorithms or AI algorithms specific to quantum computing. When quantum computing is a reality, and I think there's a lot of debate in terms of when exactly that will happen, um, my guess is there is gonna be a fair amount of intersection there. Yeah. And I would take that even further. I mean, a lot of the work that we do in our strategic missions um, program is looking at that horizon three, five, and 10, and even beyond that. And so AI and quantum is definitely the next step. We're actually seeing AI quantum and 5G as the next part, and For space. Sure. And For so sure. over the course of the next couple of years, we're leveraging space and different satellites to really help from an AI perspective. We're doing a lot of work with the US federal government. I know you talked a little bit about planetary compute and images from space. We're doing a lot in that realm as well. And so that'll really be the next evolution. I know there are still a lot of individuals and firms around the globe that are still grappling Sorry. with getting to cloud. <laughs> and so I think this is gonna be a continuous evolution over time, but that's the direction that we're seeing. Any additional thoughts, Daniel, on this regulatory to wrapper on this whole thing? Well, on the regulatory side, I, I think uh, Nadia really uh, st struck the right point there because um, look at Europe. There, I think f Europe is leading the regulatory uh, tight uh, on AI. There's an uh, there's an EU act uh, on this. Um, I think the reason for it is that um, Europe is very concerned also about the ethical use of, of AI, and it goes hand in hand with GDPR, as Nadia pointed out, right? So data data privacy is is is, is a key element now of European DNA in in business, right? So the the point about AI as well, and and here specifically generative AI, is that a lot of people while experimenting with it they use data sets that are not necessarily their own. Mm -hmm. There could be lots of cases for, 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 for copyright infringements uh, or even a breach of confidentiality because they, they, they think that data is safe in that algorithm. And I hate to say, we have absolutely no transparency. What happens to that data? And I even think that sooner or later, you will just get uh, the terms and conditions for using an application like chat GTP or others, where you just wave off your rights that, to this data that you feed this algorithm with. And I think there is something where uh, Europe is taking increasingly a lead on intellectually to say, we must put some you know, parameters, some, some limitations to that. And so to me, it goes a bit hand in hand with the spirit that we have seen when uh, GDPR was introduced. And in other parts of the world, which I don't know how the legislation is taking shape so much, but I, I have the feeling maybe it's still a little bit more liberal in this regard. So I would look at uh, you know Asia and 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 the U.S. in particular, but 
maybe our audience knows, knows what is in the pipeline in terms of regulatory intervention there. Can I, uh, I think federated learning ought to be thrown into here uh, as a really provocative way to address some of this. If you can create isolation, just to make it kind of clear for the general audience, you, you, the last mile of the of the the data chain is, let's say, the individual bank. So you can you have specific, discrete information that you own that's yours, that's private, and you have a whole bunch of other people have that. If you do that very effectively, and Microsoft's doing some really mm -hmm. good work in this area, um, if you do that very effectively, there is privacy built into all of the banks. And then they can share and they can see only what they're willing to give and they can combine with two or three or more or one to many different other institutions that have a greater security and still maintain their individual privacy. It's tremendously cool. Confidential compute. Yes, <laughs> it's tremendously cool. I'm going to have to wrap us there. We're at time, but uh, hope it was a pleasure to be your opening act. Thank you for the questions from the audience that stimulated a lot of discussion in the polls. And thank you to our fantastic panel. If you could give a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs>